America is a land of great museums, and every museum has spellbinding stories to tell. There was a point in the backstretch where they were neck and neck, stride for stride. It must have been heart-stopping for everybody who was watching. There are many who would consider a jockey pound for pound the best athlete in the world. Do you want to know everything you possibly can about that horse before you put your money up? It's a thrilling sport. Horsepower, the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, New York. Next on Great Museums. Major funding for Great Museums is provided by the Eureka Foundation, dedicated to the educational power of television and new media. Exercise your curiosity. Explore America's Great Museums. A racehorse coming out of the gate can reach 40 miles per hour in about two and a half seconds. That statistic alone is amazing, but then when you compare that to a Ferrari getting to 60 miles an hour in five and a half seconds, side by side, it's just amazing. And at one time, all four legs are off the ground. That horse is, quote, almost flying. Nothing is touching the ground. The feeling when I'm on their back, traveling at 40 miles an hour, that's indescribable. Thoroughbreds are a half ton of sheer power and muscle. From rest to top speed, a horse's heart rate increases by a factor of 10. A man's by a factor of four. That's what they're meant to do. That's why they were bred over two centuries ago, was to run. It's that tension, that strength, that drive to win uh, that really captures the thoroughbred. Secretariat, Man of War, Citation, and Seabiscuit. Names etched into our collective memory images of grace and stamina. The National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, New York, tells the story of racing in America from the early 18th century to the present day. Home to stories of the horses, the jockeys, the trainers, tracks, and trophies. The museum brims with racing memorabilia and a renowned collection of the finest equestrian art there's no other museum in the country that is devoted to the sport of thoroughbred racing. Racing is the oldest sport we have in this country. And for a long time, it was the only game in town. begins, there's murmuring and there's, uh, there's noise, and then as the race uh, rounds the turn to the home stretch, usually there's a roar in the crowd, and it's, there's nothing like that roar. It's a photo finish that doesn't deserve a loser! We're very near one of the most beautiful racetracks in the, in the world, Saratoga, right across the street from the Racing Museum, and it is a beautiful, beautiful racetrack. It's been around here since 1864. Saratoga the oldest operating racetrack in the United States, has been modernized a bit, but it still has the atmosphere of days gone by. Just steps away from this grand historic track, the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame celebrates the thrill of the race from start to finish. There's a lot of pageantry, there's a lot of grandeur, there's certainly a lot of excitement, as much excitement as there is at any other sporting event. The museum began in 1950 with a shoe, it belonged to the stallion, Lexington. Lexington was one of the premier sires of uh, racehorses in the 19th century. Some people have said that he actually ran out of his shoes. <laughs> I like to refer to thoroughbred racing as America's first major sport. And that excitement has gone over for generations, um, going all the way back to almost the founding of the United States. Uh, George Washington was an avid horseman. Thomas Jefferson was an avid horseman. In America, gentlemen of the privileged elite carried on the racing traditions of the English gentry. Racing has been known for centuries as the sport of kings. The oldest object in the collection is view of the round course at Newmarket by John Wooten, which dates to 1720. This painting, along with the 19th century English paintings in the Terriot collection, provides a glimpse into the English roots of racing. This is our only way to see what the racetracks look like, to see how the patrons milled about, to see that there were women as well as men in the audience, uh, how the horses came up to the start, what it was like when they were finishing. 
courses are not inexpensive and never have been to buy and train, but the actual crowds who attended these races have always been the common man. Then as now, money permeates all aspects of racing. In the early days, silk purses were hung up by the finish line and taken down by the winner. Today, the owners compete for the purse or the prize money, and the spectators gamble on the outcome. Betting is certainly the fuel that keeps racing going. It's actually what runs the racetracks. The public establishes the track odds based on how much you favor a horse or not. You can bet on the horse to win first, to place first or second, or to show first, second, or third. But it doesn't stop there. You have daily doubles, you have triples, you have exactas, you have quinellas, pick fours, four straight winners, pick six, six straight winners, super factors, super this, super that, so they're almost any sort of a bet you can make. There was a time when I thought I could beat them, and that was youthful exuberance. And if you can't beat them, join them. Owners spend millions of dollars each year pursuing natural-born champions. In antebellum America, the artist Edward Troy traveled the country painting portraits of horses, horses that were their owner's pride and joy. Since photography wasn't very prevalent, this is how you capture the beauty and the essence of, of your particular racehorse is through portraiture. He really is the first American painter to more accurately capture the conformation or the actual bone and muscular structure of the horse, and he depicted that very well. We luckily have his paintbrushes, a palette knife, some of his terracotta pots, field glasses, one of his pocket watches, and a first edition of his book, Race Horses of America. This book is a beautiful record of thoroughbred heritage for breeders and buyers. If you're buying horses and you're going to put up a million dollars, you want to know everything you possibly can about that horse before you put your money up. Well, there's a quote about breeding, you know, breed the best to the best and hope for the best. Bone structure, disposition, and confirmation are all passed down from generation to generation. All of the thoroughbreds in, in the world can be traced back to three foundation sires. Matcham, Herod, and Eclipse. About 90% of all of the thoroughbreds in the world trace back to him. Now, people say records are made to be broken. There's one record that won't be broken. One of his descendants was the fabulous Seattle Slough. Fold in 1974, this champion had a genetic spark. Some of his offspring sold at auction for as much as $4.2 million. The Anatomy Gallery traces Seattle Slough's lineage through Philly and Sire. Head to the museum's library to do the same for any thoroughbred on record. We've got the stud books, so that if somebody wants to find out lineage of their horse or a horse, we can look it up there. These books are the genealogy of thoroughbreds, the family Bible, per se. Bloodlines are important, but proper lineage does not a champion make. It's like two brothers, can both of them do everything exactly the same, not even twins do that. It gives you a clue. A clue into the pieces that make up each individual. Pasterns, withers, and cannon bones mean little to the average spectator, but they are everything to owners and trainers. Yeah, no, she's the real deal. Okay, Trainer Phil Gleaves has been at it since 1985. The most challenging part of my job is keeping horses sound because they run very fast on an artificial surface usually and that plays havoc with their legs. So keeping the horses together, holding them together is the most challenging aspect of the job. Bright and early every morning, Phil and his staff are out here caring for their charges. The museum provides tours of the Oklahoma training track to give visitors a sense of everything that goes into their day of fun at the races. The trainers at Saratoga carry on a legacy that includes the legendary Ben Jones and his son, Jimmy Jones. They had two Triple Crown winners, Whirl Away and Citation. Citation was the world's first thoroughbred millionaire. The museum has his blanket. It's sort of rare to get horse blankets because people tend to either use them until they wear out or they, they throw them away. 
So we felt very lucky to be able to get something uh, this valuable, especially because it was over 50 years old and it could have just disappeared. A lot of these things tend to. Most horses don't have a burst of speed more than one time. Our Carol, when he rode him, said Citation had two or three bursts of speed. Eddie Arcaro should know. He was one of the best jockeys of the 20th century. There are many who would consider a jockey pound for pound the best athlete in the world. Imagine you're under five feet tall. You usually are a little bit over 100 pounds, and you have to sit on this 1,000-pound horse and control it. And your means of control are mainly your arms and your legs so that you can run at about 30 to 40 miles an hour. Part of the race is making weight. It was common for young boys of the right size to get tossed up on a horse. Isaac Murphy was one of those riders. African-American jockeys were very prevalent in the late 19th century. Southern slave owners really started the tradition of using black jockeys because they used their slaves as their jockeys during that time. Born in 1861 as a free man, Isaac Murphy's record has never been matched. He won 44% of his races. Leading owners of horses were paying him $10,000 a year just for first call on his services, meaning that he would ride their horses first if asked, and then he had other owners set up for second and third call. One of his most intense races took place at the Coney Island Jockey Club on June 26, 1890, the great $10,000 match race. It was horse against horse, rider against rider. Murphy rode Salvatore. His rival, Snapper Garrison, rode Tenney. Isaac Murphy and Snapper Garrison both were known for these heartbreaking, heart-stopping finishes where they'd keep together right till the very end and then one would surge ahead. And that's what happened in this particular race. Murphy surged ahead almost at the last possible moment. A match race is really the simplest kind of race because it's just pitting two horses against each other. They've been common since racing began. It kind of parallels many of the larger themes in our history and culture. In 1823, the time was right for North and South to go head to head. American Eclipse was an eight-year-old on a winning streak from the North. Sir Henry and thousands of fans walked up to the Union course on Long Island to challenge him. National honor was at stake. On the appointed day, 60,000 people arrived, which was a tremendous crowd. Even by today's standards, 60,000 people is a pretty big crowd. Supposedly 20,000 of those people came up from the South to watch the match, so you know that the enthusiasm for the race was widespread. This authentic silk scarf represents the three strenuous four-mile heats. The top scene shows Sir Henry beating American Eclipse. After the first heat, American Eclipse gets a new rider. His name is Samuel Purdy. Samuel Purdy's whip and lucky racing colors did the trick. American Eclipse wins the second heat. Then for the third heat, Sir Henry gets a new rider, but it's not enough to, to turn the tide and American Eclipse wins the third heat as well. The North has won. After the Civil War was over during America's period of westward expansion, the scene of competition began to shift to an East versus West match race. Westward expansion meant California, and the 1930s meant the Great Depression. The West hung their hopes on an apparent misfit. Seabiscuit was a short, stocky bay with a funky gait. The miracle of the story is that when Tom Smith, the trainer, took over Seabiscuit, Tom Smith was able to search out that particular quality or those particular conditions that would help Seabiscuit overcome those qualities that were holding him back. Seabiscuit was making a name for himself up and down the West Coast. When he won the Agua Caliente in Tijuana, Mexico, his owners, the Howards, were presented with a sterling silver trophy made in London in 1864. This unique trophy was stolen in the 1950s. A half century later, a woman turned up at the museum with something to sell. So I went over and she said she had a trophy that she was interested in selling, and she said it was Seabiscuit's Agua Caliente trophy. And immediately the alarm bells went off. Finally, they determined that Yes, indeed, it did belong to the Howard family, and the federal judge returned the trophy to the Howards, and they graciously have donated it to the museum. So it was our first Seabiscuit trophy that we had added to the collections. Seabiscuit was the shining star of the West. War Admiral 
having just won the Triple Crown, was the king of the East. He was a very regal and beautiful looking horse, whereas Seek Biscuit, he wasn't quite so regal looking. The match race was on. East versus West would finally have their day at the races. They met at Pimlico on November 1st, 1938. They filled the stands, they filled the infield, they thronged the streets outside. It was a huge crowd. There was a point in the back stretch where they were neck and neck, stride for stride, and it must have been absolutely thrilling and heart stopping for everybody who was watching. But um, as they came back around um, the near turn, um, Seabiscuit pulled ahead and he won by four lengths. It touched a heart string for a lot of people and make them want to believe that they can overcome the odds too and beat their war admirals. <laughs> we all have them. And Seabiscuit did it without his longtime jockey, Red Pollard. Pollard's leg had been injured. Doctors were uncertain if he would ever walk again, let alone ride. It was his turn to beat the odds. Red Pollard was given a St. Christopher's Medal for good luck. And the great irony, of course, is that, he, and maybe it's not so ironic, he really needed that good luck medal. If you look at that leg brace, the amazing thing is it's so narrow and you can really see how the injury caused his leg muscles to atrophy because it's just a tiny brace when you think about it going. It looks like it would fit my arm as opposed to a man's leg. It was that leg brace that made it possible for him to continue to ride. A year later, Red Pollard and Seabiscuit would win the 1940 Santa Anita Handicap. In the mid 20th century, there's another shift that occurs that fascinates me where you begin to see competitions between the best filly and the best colt. The horse that would carry the torch for her sex was an undefeated three-year-old filly named Ruffian. The unquestionable fact is that Ruffian was one of the best fillies of the 20th century and she really did try to prove it and she had the will. She was a gorgeous, gorgeous horse. Once she won the Philly Triple Crown, it was only natural that people started to say, well, if she's the best filly, let's figure out who's the best colt and then put the two of them against each other in a match and see who comes out ahead. Foolish Pleasure was the chosen colt. The fans wore buttons in support of their favorite horse when they went to Belmont that day. The spectators of the nationally televised race were completely unprepared for what was about to happen. The two really raced neck and neck for most of the race. Ruffian began to pull away. And all of a sudden, it looked like Foolish Pleasure went into overdrive and just turned on another gear. But you realize that wasn't what was happening. Ruffian was, was breaking down and had to be pulled up. She faltered, but kept running. She had catastrophically broken her front ankle, her right front ankle, and it stunned the crowd. An immediate hush. It's the quietest I ever heard a racetrack. One of the strangest sights I've seen in racing was turning for home. There's one horse on the racetrack because Ruffian couldn't finish the race. That really ended match racing as any kind of major form of competition in thoroughbred racing today. They tried to save her, but in the end, Ruffian had to be destroyed. She couldn't take the pressure she put on herself, is what a lot of people have said. The only race she ever lost was her last race. Going to the start. Just minutes later, the race will be won. This dramatic scene is wonderfully captured by premier sporting artist Alfred Munnings. He played with light and color quite a bit. You can see he really takes great pains with the colors of the silks and the contrast with the sky and the lightness and darkness. At the start, there are many, but in the end, only one. And to the victor goes the trophy. These pieces are considered art in a lot of ways, and they're gorgeous pieces of silver that have many decorative and, and stylistic elements that are just gorgeous in their own right and historically important in their own right. And then you add to that the uh, importance of the races that they signify for the 20th century, you've got some wonderful things. Like this, 18-gauge sterling silver and 18-karat gold trophy. Cartier designed it for the crown jewel of racing, the Triple Crown. The three sides of this deceptively simple design represent victory in three of the toughest races of the season. It all begins with the most exciting two minutes in sports, the Kentucky Derby. The Derby occurs on the first weekend in May. Two weeks later, you have the Preakness that's run in Maryland, and then three weeks later, you have the Belmont Stakes. 
it's such a difficult series in a rather constrained time period. In about six weeks, you've got to win three races, and you know the Belmont is the longest of the three. So even if you've won the first two, and many horses are able to make it through those first two, and then they can't make it through the third one at Belmont. Some people say you have to be lucky to the, win the Derby. You gotta be good to win the Belmont. In 1919, a horse named Sir Barton won it. And then no one won it until 1930, and then 35, and then 37, and then 41, and 43, and 46, and 48. But it seemed to be coming along winning left and right here. Then there was a 25-year gap to 1973. And then we had three in 73, 77, 78. And it stopped. In 1978, Affirmed won the series. It was the last Triple Crown win of the 20th century. Affirmed was a unique Triple Crown winner because he ran against such a big rival in Aladar. That rivalry is counted as one of the premier rivalries of the 20th century. If they came down to a photo finish, you can bet on Affirmed because I don't know how he did it, but he just would not allow another horse to get by him. People save their tickets. We've got placemats, ice coolers postcards, uh, scrapbooks. Um, somebody even went and got some of Affirm's tail hair from a groom and saved it, so we have that in the exhibit. People have done quilts to Affirmed. Uh, the fan base is still rather large. The Triple Crown and the Breeders' Cup are considered the bookends of the racing season. Saratoga Racetrack's main event falls in the middle. Every August, the best of the best meet at the Travers. About 25,000 people live in Saratoga. On Travers Day, with decent weather. There are gonna be at least double, 50,000 people inside that racetrack. One third of all visitors to the museum come during the season. A rainy day at the track means crowds at the museum. It's exciting for us. We like the crowds. Uh, the museum is built to accommodate large crowds and we take all comers. Just like thoroughbred racing itself, I think that momentum, that excitement, and that thrill that is generated by a crowd is part of the whole experience. The Secretariat Bronze by John Scaping in the museum courtyard is one of the objects the crowds come to see. It captures not only the action of thoroughbred racing, but it captures a absolutely incredible event of Secretariat's uh, Triple Crown win, especially his 31 length lead in the Belmont. Uh, and Secretariat was a horse that was just so uh, revered during his lifetime and still today that I think that bronze overall captures the museum. Thoroughbred Racing's Hall of Fame, housed at the museum, boasts wall after wall of racing's best. We have an induction every year. What happens is a jockey, a trainer, and at least two horses, contemporary male and contemporary female, will go into the Hall of Fame. It's not something that comes easily. It's something that is hard won for all of those different candidates. Tom Smith, American Eclipse, War Admiral. D. Wayne Lucas, Willie Shoemaker, Seabiscuit. Julie Crone, the first woman to be inducted. She's not in the Hall of Fame because she's a woman. She's in the Hall of Fame because she's a jockey and a damn good one. Julie Crone was the first woman ever to win the Belmont Stakes. She did it on Colonial Affair in 1993. She retired in 1999, which is one of the reasons we were able to have her donate to us her saddle and her helmet that are on display. The saddle's red, white, and blue and has her initials JK on it. And the helmet, uh, all jockey apparel just amazes me, but particularly hers because it's all so small. <laughs> Racing is one of the only sports where men and women compete in the same races on equal ground. And I think it's very important to have a spot where all of these artifacts can be gathered, the story can be gathered, uh, and a coherent story of racing through the, the decades, through the ages can be told. The horses, the trainers, the jockeys, the fans, the racing silks, souvenirs, trophies, and paintings. Just fabulous mementos that really show the everyday life of these people involved in racing and what they wore, what they rode in, what they, what they had to deal with. And it sort of gives us a glimpse into how their lives operated and what they dealt with. 
I would hope that a visitor to the museum would take away a sense of the connections between thoroughbred racing and our history and culture, and just take away the excitement of racing. There are a lot of people who come in here because they're accompanying an avid thoroughbred racing fan. They leave here and they can't wait to get across the street to the track because they've realized that it's, it's a thrilling sport. Learn more about America's great museums at greatmuseums.org. You can order this episode or another Great Museums program on home video for $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping and handling. Call 1-888-227-5865 or order online at greatmuseums.org. Museums hold the treasures and tell the tales of the people and places that make America great. for great museums is provided by the Eureka Foundation, dedicated to the educational power of television and new media. Exercise your curiosity. Explore America's great museums.